Okay, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I enjoy everything that there is a dope, uh, everything there is about wood turning, and it's uh, turning, reading about it, watching DVDs, hanging out with turners, demonstrating, teaching, uh, recently making YouTube videos. I created a blog, a blog spot, mostly as a receptacle or a place, a repository for any articles that I've published. Uh, I've got a, you can download some of the articles that, uh, any article I've published there. I've got uh, handouts for any demonstration I've done available there and some links to some YouTube videos, although I quit posting the most recent links. So I figured if you can get out to, to YouTube, you can find uh, all the videos that I've made. Tonight I want to talk about uh, making boxes, which I think just a lot of fun. It's an opportunity to be really creative with boxes. You can use small pieces of wood. Hey, if you have a mistake, throw it away. You haven't lost a whole lot. Grab another one. It's all good practice. Some days you get the bear, and some days the bear gets you. Um, the disclaimer that I always make is uh, the way I'm sh going to show you tonight is not the only way. I won't even say it's the best way, but it's the way I, I do it. And usually it's after some careful consideration and having watched a lot of people and, and, and doing some study about it because I'm, I'm kind of an analytical uh, type of person. So. But any comments or questions at any time, please, please stop me. What I want to talk about tonight is uh, everything from, we're going to talk about wood selection, we're going to talk about hollow and green wood, we want to talk about, I'm going to show you how to, how to uh, uh, turn a box. Uh, if we get some time, we'll, you know, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, chucking methods, and if we get time, uh, we'll talk a little bit about embellishing boxes and a little bit about, about box design. So let's go ahead and get started with first on rough turning a, a block of wood. Generally, for, for boxes, you want straight grain wood without a lot of flaws, defects, you know, a little small pinhole knot might be all right, but you really want, ideally, straight grain wood, especially if you're going to thread the boxes, which we're not going to get into tonight. Uh, first thing you do, uh, some people advocate only, only uh, kiln-dried wood, nothing wrong with that, but the trouble is that kind of limits you pretty much to ash. Uh, maple and, and cherry, and then you're letting go all the really nice, fine domestic wood, such as this ornamental cherry we're going to be turning tonight, and certainly uh, exotic woods would be out of the, out of the question if you r rely on kill dry wood, and if you're threading, that eliminates a lot of domestic wood, and you're kind of resorting in many instances to only a very few uh, domestic woods and exotic woods, which you're going to have to figure out a way to do that, and that's process I'm going to show you is rough turning. So, how many of y'all have never turned a box before? Well, I hope I get y'all inspired and motivated. For those of y'all who have turned one before, maybe I'll get you inspired and motivated to go back and try again because they are a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through the basics, uh, starting with marking centers. Uh, you know, I used one of those plastic center finders for a long time, and I found that this is just so much faster and easier. Just mark your square, just brace your finger in a consistent way. How many of y'all are big Harbor Freak fans? I'm a big Harbor Freak fan. This is a, their $1.99 or $2.99 special. You, trouble is you got to get about three of them and take two of them back, you know, because they don't work. But that's okay because they're real good about, about warranting their stuff and, and, uh, and making you good. So we're going to turn this thing between centers. Somebody that's got a handout is going to be following it. If you, uh, I have a volunteer. Somebody kind of remind me because I tend to skip over these sometimes. Item number 7, 13, 18, and 25 where it says stop and, and sand and finish. Somebody on the front row want to kind of remind me of, hey, you want to sand that before you take it loose. Do you have any volunteers? Going once? Yeah, we'll tell you. Going twice? Okay. Okay. Rotate it, make sure it clears. I've got some good tools and I've got some cheap tools and sometimes the cheap ones are good enough. This is an old Harbor Freight uh, roughing gouge. It works, it's small, it's light, makes it easy to carry. This is a small block, so we want to get the speed up a little bit. You notice I brace this thing in on the side, against my side, and I do what we call the turn stand. Just move my body. Come in from each side in case there's a crack or split. You don't want to get a big splinter off, flying off. So. Readjust the tool rest to get a little closer support. I 
not like a roughened wood, a little bit like uh, slicing bananas for your breakfast. You don't want to cut your finger off, but you don't get points for, you know, for style. Just, you know, get this, get it done. The kind of box I'm going to make tonight one looks a little bit like this, maybe a little squattier. This is a, some people call that an elegant box. Uh, one trick, trick that I used, or use, is for your particular chuck, find out what works for you, and sometimes just laying a pencil on top of your live center may be a good way to measure the tenon. I usually use a different live center, so this will probably be off a little bit. I can eyeball it pretty good, but sometimes it pays not to take chances. So basically, that's what we're striving for. If you don't have green wood, it's just like turning a, a box. You're going to uh, turn it dry, or, or turn it wet, rough it up, and then put it aside. And for those of y'all that like turning green wood, sometimes i probably got more box blanks than I've got bowl blanks put up just because, you know, turning green wood's fun. The chips fly, I put it on the shelf, maybe I never get back to it. That's okay, too, because I had fun uh, turning it. Now let's put it in the chuck. I use Tecma tool chucks, not necessarily because they're the best, it's because of what I got used to and what I started with. Uh, this is the, uses the Tommy bars. I don't much like it, but it's the one I had that was the uh, eight inch that I had for my mini lathe. Somebody count how many times I dropped these, these bars. If I can make it without dropping more than three times, I'll be doing good. They are pretty nice lathe. They're well made lathes and they're nice and lightweight for a mini lathe, but they are a bit of a bit of a bother. Now what I generally do before I chuck it up, I look to decide which end is going to be the base and which is going to be the lid based on the features. Sometimes it doesn't make any difference. And, uh, then I tend to use a set of scales like this, a Fibonacci scale. How many of y'all ever heard, not ever, have never heard of the Fibonacci series or the golden ratio? But basically it's a design concept uh, that goes back a long, long ways. It generally gives you a pleasing design of about one-third, two-thirds. So what I do, and this thing automatically scales it for me, is I set it on the end. You can see it that way. And then leaving a little bit of room for the for the tenon and parting off, and that gives me a pretty good feel where I will mark the lid. You know, I went for a long time with a parting tool thinking you always peel the whole way. And then I, I was in a Jimmy Clues class, and he said, no, you start sticking it straight in, and then you drop the handle. And I thought, really? I went back and looked at my reference books, and sure enough, Pete Rowley says do it the way he does it. Richard Raffin says do it the way he does it. And it's because it keeps it from fraying by shearing the fibers as you go in and then you drop and do the peeling cut. Now I'm giving myself a little scotia extra room. I'm taking two parts. One, so I make my cut about one and a half uh, widths of the parting tool. If this was very figured wood uh, or light dark wood uh, with some shape to it, then I might be more concerned about a narrower cut, but I'm not in this case. If I was, I'd probably done the whole thing with a uh, pen parting tool. Some people do it on a bandsaw. 
That's a little extra work. And I found for small work, if you get it down to about a thousand, it's not going to fly anywhere. It'll just normally drop. We'll test that theory. So, we're doing the bottom. We're going to make the wall thickness somewhere between uh, three and a half. We're going to get this out of the way. We're going to take off the live center so we don't get uh, Turner's elbow. <clears throat> I've heard it's very painful. I, you know, I wouldn't really know. <laughs> if you believe that. One thing about making boxes, if you don't have a short tool rest, you need to get one. <coughs> because it's hard to do it with that 12 or 14 inch rest that your lathe typically comes with, unless you've got a mini lathe. We're just going to come in here. Now from a bowl, when you're hollowing a bowl, you're normally doing side grain, so you're hollowing from the outside to the inside, right? Well, with a box, we're doing spindle orientation. We're doing end grain. So normally that means everything's going to be in the other direction. We're going to start from the middle and slice to the outside. And you'll find some people that say go from the outside in. I find this to be the, the, the way it works best for me because I find it slices better. You just pivot it. Start in again. Basically, that's the lid blank that we're going to put on the shelf for several months. Because this was cut fairly recently. And then we're going to take the, the base. Now the base, the only real difference on the base, there's one. One thing about Techno Tools, it, it operates differently from the uh, turns in the, in the other direction. It's uh, actually made in China. And what I think it is is a spindle. It's a hair too long. It is chuck. I've had that happen on the spindle adapter where the, the spindle adapter was too long and I had to put it on the lathe and uh, part it off. Let's see. And that's what it is. This is, this is perfect. This is perfect. This one that doesn't have the same problem. I think the, with the uh, insert on this, and the other one's direct threaded, so with the insert, this will probably be fine. And one thing I found on these Nova Chucks, you got the Supernova with a ball joint on it, your best bet is to cut that thing off because you really don't need this thing spinning around. When you do, it tends to wear out this uh, pintle prematurely. Base, I like to drill a starter hole to do that. I like to use the skew to just kind of get a nice gel divot in the center. And that, that prevents the drill from following the grain. And 
And all I've done is taken a quarter inch uh, drill, put it in a handle, doesn't even need a ferrule because you're not twisting or anything. I've done a few marks with a uh, Dremel cutoff tool just so I can get a feel for how deep it's going to be. And I want to get about halfway between. I grab the headstock usually. And to establish, establish your depth. Establish the depth, and it also gets rid of the slowest moving miles per hour wise. Obviously, the same RPM in the middle of the outside, but RPM wise, it's going so slow. So it makes it a little, a little easier not to have to worry about that dimple in the middle all the time. Now, just so you can kind of see the angle, let me get this little gadget here. So I'm, I'm pointing this thing at about 10 o'clock and just pivoting it and slicing. Now the base, the trick is you got to make the, the, the walls of the base a little bit thicker because it's going to form the tenon. So do a trial run on one of these things and then make a box out of it because otherwise you're going to have 10 or 20 blanks and you find it may not be suitable. So kind of think through it a little bit. It's not always intuitively obvious to the casual observer until you go through the whole process. Anyway, that's, you get the picture. And then we're going to face off the end of it here just a little bit. You're going to have to do this sooner or later. So basically, we're going to wind up with something like this. And then what I do, uh, I didn't do it on this time, but, but what I try to remember to do uh, is when it's in the chuck, clean off the end, remove that, any damage from the live center and tail center, uh, drive center, so you got to turn around and do the other side. And do that before you actually uh, part it off. And it does a couple of things. It gets rid of a little wood that makes it dry better. It also makes sure that if, when, in your box design, if you use every bit of the wood as you might, you don't have to be surprised by having this dimple at, at the end of your box, either uh, the foot or the base. Also makes it a uh, lot flatter and easier to put together when you tape it. And then you want to put the, the, the right on the wood itself, not to tape, because tape generally will come loose sooner or later, what the species is, what's the date, and if there's something special about it, like you got it from somebody, it's somebody's special tree, mark that on there, because I'll tell you what, six months from now, you got a bunch of scraps of wood around, it all looks the same. So keep a record. But anyway, that's what, that's what uh, you know, the blank uh, is going to look like that you're going to save. Now, how long it takes for these things to dry? I would say give it six months. Uh, some woods, it really doesn't, it doesn't take that long. Even if it's kiln dried wood, it's not a bad idea to rough it out and give it a few days to kind of relax because you've got internal stresses in the wood that even on dry wood, wood moves. So here's one that I did a while back. This is the one I'm going to be turning tonight. So this has been sitting on a shelf and it's already dry. So we're going to start with the lid. Now there's a sequence to this that really is important. Generally speaking, when you make boxes, you normally do the lid first for an overfitting box. And I'll show you why that is true in, in, just, a, in just a moment. What's your opinion of putting it in a microwave? Um, you know, John Jordan's got a DVD out on wood. I'll give you a long answer because it's always a long answer. He it, it talks about characteristics of wood and drying wood and working with green wood. And, and he said something that was very profound. And he says, you know, folks that like to mess with stuff like to mess with stuff. <laughs> I don't do it. I just, you know, it's a lot of trouble. You, you make your wife real mad at you, and this, and, and this hadn't happened to me because I've never tried to microwave. Because you can really smell up the kitchen and smell up the microwave. Um, if you turn a lot, once you get started in this process and you put a few blanks away, 
After that, you got more blanks than you did. How many of y'all got bowl blanks sitting there that you know you'll never get, your widow's going to have to take care of when you die? Well, the same way with box blanks. Just have fun, enjoy the process, enjoy the green wood, and just uh, uh, get a few started and then go off on some other projects that's dry wood, and, and then you'll have an everlasting supply. So the first thing I want to do, I want to make this uh, lid not quite the same uh, diameter as the base. So I'm going to go ahead and take it down just a little bit. Just roughly, give me some kind of approximation of where I'm going before I finish hollowing it out. Another one of my little Harbor Freight toys, one of the Vargas wood turners, they've got this measurement set and it comes with a depth uh, gauge, it comes with three different sets of, four different sets of various inexpensive calipers, a little six inch ruler and all that for the grand price of nine bucks when it's on sale. Such a deal. So we want to transfer the inside diameter to the outside, so we don't want to go too much deeper than that. Now when I do the final cleanup on the inside, I typically use a scraper and it works real well on end grain. You want to use it in the negative rake uh, position. Which means handle higher than the cutting edge. Just slowly pivot it around. That's about all there is to it. Now, how hard do you press? Uh, scrapers can get you in a lot of trouble. Richard Raffin says, and, and he's my wood turning hero, is, uh, he's got a good book on boxes. He's got one of the best ones out there, I think. This was done in 1998. I think he reprinted it in 2002 with colored pictures. But he goes into a lot of detail, and he thinks through these things very, very carefully. Uh, don't get his DVD because they go too, he goes too fast. He's a production turner, kind of like Nick Cook on steroids, you know, and he goes fast. He's like, what, what, what did he do? Because uh, he's very, very fast. Okay, so we're going to use a, we're going to go down this inside now. So it's hollowed. It's got a pretty good feel to it. We'll, we'll sand it. Somebody's going to remind me about the sanding right before I take it off. We're going to come down and with a box scraper. Now, a box scraper, you've got, I think you can see that on the counter. On the, counter, on the camera. Uh, it's got a, somewhat less than a 90 degree angle right there. And it's sharpened here and it's sharpened here. So that means when I come in to get that wall, the wall's parallel, it's this angle, this line right here that I'm lining up with a bedway. So the handle's cocked forward just a little bit. Drop that down just a little bit. And since I've got this big flange in there, I want to go ahead and take that out of there. That little, little bump in the middle, you go up and down and across, up and down and across gently. Get rid of that. All right, we're going to touch this up quickly with a piece of sandpaper. We're going to look with before we finish this, we want to go ahead and detail the inside. So I'm going to start at uh, this, uh, this. I'm going to touch it up with a little 120 grit. I'm going to slow this down just a little bit. I don't normally sand as fast as I, I turn. We're not going to get crazy about this finishing, but we do want to hit it a lick and a promise.
When you do any texturing on a piece, you want to get that finish pretty close to what it needs to be because you may not have a chance to go back to it when you texture. And we're going to texture this. <laughs> 